sure there's a lot of questions. And then hopefully the speakers will be willing to stay behind. And um, if there's any other questions that they have, they can talk to them afterwards. But I'd also like to um, let you know that we have another panelist, an expert, joining us. And his name is Frank Hurick. And he's the head of Global Skater Center for Yokogawa. So in addition to the speakers, uh, we have Frank. And Frank, do you want to say a couple minutes and just talk about where your expertise is with the project and yeah. what you did? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Frank Uring, and I'm uh, working at Yokogawa's uh, Global Skater Center. And in the Global Skater Center, we are responsible for our skater product, uh, Fast Tools. And we position uh, the product fast tools on the high end of the market. And actually, that's, that's an ideal platform to build the enterprise automation system on top of it. Uh, um, so that's what we, what we used. Uh, I started uh, the journey with uh, the Chevron guys about five, six years ago. And to me, it was a very interesting journey. Um, we learned a lot. We shared visions, but we also shared possibilities. Um, we shared lessons learned from other projects. Uh, apply that on, on, on the Chevron uh, situation. And that's where we, where we went on uh, for the last, I think, five, six years, yeah, um, to provide a solution that we nowadays call the, the enterprise automation system. And actually, the, the story of uh, Graham about uh, this engineer coming at his desk uh, asking for, can I get my information on my mobile device? Uh, and, and at that time, uh, it was not possible, but we worked uh, on, on that solution, and, and nowadays it's possible. And, and maybe you say, well, why should why should we have all this operational information available on my mobile? But to me, it's the same question as we raised ourselves uh, about 10, 15 years ago. Why should we have all the the emails on my handheld device? Um, if we if we would answer that question 10, 15 years ago. Most of us would have said, oh, I don't need that. Uh, there's a separation between private time and, 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 and my work activities. Um, nowadays, I think if I would raise the question here in the audience, uh, um, everybody would raise his hand uh, because we all have our, our uh, mails available and, and continuously with us. Um, and at a certain moment, I think this, this operational information, um, we move more or less in the same direction, supporting our colleagues uh, on, on, on a 24, well, 24 7 is maybe not the right wording, but on, on, on a, a very direct way uh, will help uh, the, the operations side. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions, we have some mics that you can either come up to or I'll, I'll ask somebody from, if there's an ARC person that could just bring them around. I, I don't know if they, did these move around? No. Okay. All right, so you have to come up to the mic. But I guess I can throw out one I'd like to start. OK, well, we have a question. OK. Yes, one, two, I guess it's, uh, D Is it on? OK, it's on. OK. Uh, so I got a couple questions here, I guess, uh, two for Chevron. Regarding your UWT, what were some of the KPIs you used to really monitor on your dashboards? And then the second question is, what is the most impactful equipment or operational problem that the EA EAS has solved? Uh, to date. Here's another mic. So, so the first question is uh, KPI for UWT. Actually, uh, I can't say. I don't know because that is another organization that create the workflows. So, so certainly with with Chevron and corporate, there's got to be a value and a measure of value. So there certainly are, are KPIs out there. Just I'm on the technology, the EAS side. Uh, what was your question? So maybe talk about some of the either equipment reliability or operational. Some people right. might not have heard you. So you said talk about the equipment reliability and, sure. and, operational, and improvements. operational improvements. Right. So we realized, uh, let's talk specifically about the uh, equipment uh, decision support center. In Chevron, there are, I would say, thousands of, let's say, compressors. So we do have a lot of data there. So we take it up to the analytic part. And 
and they can run special application and predict and tell you what will go happen, right? Now, they might not see at the facil facility level because the facility level might worry about keeping it running. But at the decision support center, they can look out for those things. And then, and so our EAS will bring those information up where certain uh, subject matter expert on rotating equipment can look on the lookout for that. And we put intelligent in so that we don't have 24 by seven people just looking at that. On top of that, now, once we get that, the model that we have is uh, from facility go to business unit. Business unit have a DSC. And then and around the world we have multiple business unit and then we have a central uh, technology company. That's where all the technology, that's where I'm from is uh, ETC. In there we have a global DSC. So if it can a problem cannot be solved at the business level, it can always be we will be uh, supporting up, up, up the chain. And then once that, if we can have that, then we also bring in the supplier. Right. So do we have any, uh, do we have any other questions? But if not, I have one actually. Oh, okay, we do have one. This is for uh, Chevron on your remote monitoring. Are you monitoring or actually controlling also? Well, currently um, we're, we're uh, we have a scheme whereby we, we monitor the, the system remotely. As I think I mentioned during the, the presentation, uh, the, the, the government regulatory uh, body doesn't currently uh, give permits for operators to operate uh, hydrocarbon facilities uh, above a certain capacity in, in deep water. So, but essentially, when we design a facility, we design that with in mind. So we could very quickly, you know, if, if there's a, basically a, a, a change in, in the government's position on this, and you have to submit, a, you know, basically an application for a permit along with all of the, 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 the supporting information that, that has a high level of rigor around safety, uh, so we're kind of set to do it, but the only re that we, the reason that we can't do it at the moment is because uh, basically the, the, the government doesn't allow us. The, the, the mode in which we do some remote control is res with respect to hurricane evacuation, because in that particular instance we're not producing hyd hydrocarbons. And there's certain um, marine functions that, that, that we need to basically be able to, uh, certain functions that we need to be able to potentially control and manipulate. So we actually do that as, as, as part of our marine operations on the, on the facility, you know, in, in the traditional sense of remote control from a remote location. Okay. So in an emergency situation, essentially, you have some ability to control. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, and we, could, we could control and produce hydrocarbons in a facility today if the government you know, it was actually permitted by the government. Okay. Yeah, no, okay. I'd okay. like to build on that. Okay. So that is specifically Gulf of Mexico regulation, yeah. but I will not, the remote operation is not being ruled out. Matter of fact, uh, so that's part of the EAS vision. Uh, we have kicked off a research program to look into what remote operation where the opportunity and values. So it's still in scope. Okay. I had one for Sadara. For okay. Mike. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you talked a lot about the enterprise service bus. I think it's, you know, very interesting. Uh, it's out there. A uh, lot of companies have tried to adopt it. You guys seem to have good success with it. Uh, is it BizTalk or TIPCO or what have you been using? Yeah. I, I, I I think I made a, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, oh no, you can't, can't hear me. Let me try this. Hello, yeah, I uh, had made a comment earlier that I'm uh, not at uh, liberty to give out the product information, but, uh, but I'll tell you that uh, um, you typically go through a beneficial engineering phase where you're going through the, uh, what are the three, you know, two, top two or three uh, services uh, available. Um, what drove our decision was based on the uh, fault tolerance and the site integration requirements. 
Um, and so your your leaders are you know Oracle, Tipco, and uh, Bizdoc. So depending wow. on, depending on you know you know how tightly you want to get in, uh, you know, and what kind of uh, requirements are you can. Those are some of those. One last question, just related to the Internet of Things, right? You talked a lot about the portable electronic devices. Have you guys made the leap to connect with iOS, Android devices, or are you talking field-hardened devices or something? Uh, this, no, not, not to the iOS uh, device, no. Uh, these are field-hardened, and of course, there's uh, a lot of security you know, concerns that uh, have to be taken into consideration as well. So. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we have another question here. Yeah, we uh, talked about real time. Now I can see real time being different depending on what levels you're, you're at. Could you, uh, you know, if you were an operator and you want this information real time, maybe in the seconds level. If you're a business planner, maybe a daily, do you store just one set of data or do you have multiple or different kinds of data stored in different spots depending on who is actually the user? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. Um, the KPIs that I talked about, um, they're broadly classified you know, under production consumption and utilities, but uh, they were calculated at different times you know, and, uh, and rendered differently depending on the business needs. Um, some of the information gets stored in the historian and you know, it can grab uh, on an as-needed basis. Okay. Well, I think probably we need to close this um, close the session, and I'd like to just to have some closing remarks from everybody on the panel, just very short, if we could, and just because I think people are running out to lunch. So. You want to? Anybody wants to start? <laughs> just, I mean, just maybe even talk about. Um, one thing is maybe just mention the, the one thing that I was interested in is the collaboration required between the supplier <coughs> and, and the company, you know, and how hard that is to manage and what resources and things like that. I thought that would be an interesting, you know, aspect to look at. Right. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here. But again, like I say, this for us is a journey. If we have a common value and uh, I guess the, the team component that Graham mentioned is a journey that involves a lot of people. So we we still on the journey and we getting closer. Good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think this uh, this partnering uh, is, is to us it's very important uh, and it uh, it requires a, a solid structure around it to be able to work. Um, to a goal that's not clear uh, at, at the start. Uh, so that's, that's, for us, it's a very important uh, structure in partnering uh, together. Yeah, very similar. I think the whole concept of partnering applies uh, to us. Uh, you know, um, uh, you have a, your own partner that helps you with, the, with, with your staffing needs, and then, you know, we have a lot of third-party applications uh, and the vendors who actually came in uh, to help us. Uh, the fact that we made some decisions on the technology earlier and then basically said, hey, here's the platform we're going to use to, to, to develop our solutions. But, but they're an integral part of um, our success here, you know, and without them, we, we really can't really do this. So. Okay. Graham, would you like to say a couple? Yeah, more? quite some time ago now. <laughs> uh, earlier in my career, um, a, a manager that I worked for talked about three things. He said, you know, from an from a automation perspective, he said, we always talk about hardware and we always talk about software. He said, but there's a, a, a really, really important third component. And uh, he basically said, that's peopleware. Um, without peopleware, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how, how elaborate or advanced or sophisticated are, are basically hardware and software solutions. Uh, it's basically the peopleware part of it that, that binds it all together and, and, and delivers value. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much, and I appreciate everybody for coming and staying, and I also would like to thank our speakers. <laughs> <laughs>